patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 92 of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Tylowski. Thank you all so much for joining me this week. Hope you are having a wonderful summer so far as the summer activities and festivities kick off. As a kind reminder, make sure to subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our email list if you want to get the latest notifications about new episodes and new updates. Next month, we will have some major announcements to make, and I hope that you will tune in, and we've got a lot more. And I just want to also note that we are getting so close to episode 100. I'm so excited for that milestone, and it's going to be here before you know it. So make sure to uh, subscribe and to keep note of what's going on with the Friends and Fellow Citizens podcast. This week, we are focusing a bit more on a a branch of the federal government that we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to or as much attention to, and that is on the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, today we're going to be delving a bit into history, trivia, fun facts with our special guest this week, Dr. Elizabeth Lane. Elizabeth A. Lane is an assistant professor of political science at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She studies American politics with a focus on the United States Supreme Court. Particularly, her research centers on attorneys and the interplay between law and politics, and ultimately how these relationships shape justice's decision-making and the public perceptions of the court. Her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and published in the Journal of Law and Courts and American Politics Research. For more information on her research, visit www.elizabethalane.com. Link will down be in the show notes below. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Lane to our podcast. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on our program today. And thank you for having me. Well, we've got a big topic to cover. Uh, We've never done an episode like this before on the topic of the Supreme Court, really law and politics in general. Um, This is, I I guess, I consider myself a trivia connoisseur rather than a Supreme Court knowledgeable person about it. (laughs) So um, we'll see. We'll we'll see what works best in the future. But um, I'm I'm very very interested in the topic. I know that a lot of people are interested in this too. Um, So, but before we get to that, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you really got interested in in this particular topic of political science? Yeah, so um, I was a political science pre-law for undergrad, and I took a, with all intentions of going to law school, and I took a class called Judicial Politics and Process, and I remember reading this one particular article. It's still one of my favorite articles till this day. It's um, by Greg Caldera and Wright. Uh, it was published in 1988. And it basically says that when interest groups file amicus briefs at the agenda stage for the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter if they're trying to get the court to hear the case or deny review to the case. That sheer number of briefs signals to the court that it's important. And they're more likely to grant review. And I was like, well, why would interest groups waste their time filing briefs in opposition to denying review? Like, that doesn't make any sense if it's going to make the court grant review. And that's kind of what started it. And it snowballed from there. I was lucky to have a great mentor in Reggie Sheehan, who now works for the National Science Foundation. And he kind of took me under his wing. And I wrote a senior thesis with him. And I was kind of off to the races and applied to grad school. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I've I've already expressed how difficult it was for me to go through law school. So at least we can share that so we almost went down that path, but we found found a better path for ourselves. Luckily, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's that's wonderful, and I, I really want to get started with. I guess if you can imagine going into a virtual time machine, going back in time a little bit, um, and 
you know, we speak a lot about the founders, but we're not going to go too much into specifically maybe Washington or Jefferson. I mean, some they'll certainly have their roles there. Uh, but I want to really go back to the early days of the Supreme Court. And uh, if you can, uh, Elizabeth, tell us about what those kinds of debates were about the role of the federal judiciary, um, because uh, I think a lot of people would say that uh, there were founders who were concerned that ju- the judiciary could be used as an arm, if you like, quote, in quotes, arm of the legislature or of the executive or someone who, who really wants to who really wants to change the way things run. Uh, so tell us about what those debates were like back in the 1780s, 1790s, generally speaking. Yeah, so just to kind of give some background, um, Article 3 is the shortest of the the first three articles of the Constitution. So it's only a thousand words compared to Article 1, which obviously deals with uh, the legislative branch and um, Article 2, which deals with the executive branch. They're double, triple that length. Um, and so... The founders didn't really kind of know what to do with the judiciary. And I think one of the most places this is evident is in their lack of creation of lower federal courts. They kind of said, we'll leave this up to Congress, right? And early on, we didn't even have circuit court judges because Supreme Court justices were expected to what we call ride circuit. Um, where they would pair up with district court judges. And then that was problematic because they could potentially review a case at the circuit court level and then at the Supreme Court level. Um, The Supreme Court also didn't have a lot of power. Uh, As Hamilton famously writes in Federalist Number 78, the court had neither, I don't think he says it like this, but this is kind of the way that political scientists have come to phrase it. They had neither the power of the purse nor the sword, right? So they didn't have the budgetary ability that Congress has to support any of their decisions, right? And they didn't have the bureaucratic power that the executive branch has to enact their decisions. And so that was a debate um, with regard to judicial review. And there is some kind of hints that the the framers intended for judicial review. But of course, that's not in the Constitution at all. Um, And we I guess we can get into that. uh, If we want to talk about, you know, John Marshall and what he did for the court. But um, another important debate is laid out by Hamilton in Federalist number 76. Um, So he talks about how we should appoint judges. And he lays out three possibilities, right? So just the executive, just what he calls the assembly in reference to Congress, um, or both of them. And he basically says that, well, a presidential appointment would be not great because um, it would lead to corruption and favoritism. And this is also because like the part of the Constitution that allows the president to appoint justices also allows him to appoint a lot of other roles as well. And then he said that Congress wouldn't work, or the assembly, as he calls it, um, because this would lead to the court being too partisan. It would become a partisan fight and not be based on merit or who is the most qualified, which I mean, we can talk about how how that has worked out because um, he kind of saw the writing on the wall, I guess you could say. And he defends this idea of advice and consent by the Senate. Um, so the president appoints and then the Senate confirms to avoid the pitfalls of just having, you know, one branch or the other be re- completely responsible for this process and ensure checks and balances, separation of powers, um, so that so that neither has too much power and to try to avoid this favoritism and partisan kind of fighting. Um, and I think, you know, another re- thing that's important to note is that what was really important to the framers was judicial independence. Um, and so that is why, first of all, they're appointed. Um, And second of all, they have lifetime tenure. 
Uh, and third, Congress can't you know, lower their salaries while they're serving. They can refuse to give them a raise, but they can't lower them because they wanted to ensure that justices weren't looking to answer to any constituents and also like for their next job. So they weren't deciding cases based on what would get them their next job and they were intended for them to decide them based on the law. But at the beginning of the judiciary uh, in the Supreme Court and our nation's founding, it was a very undesirable job, not only because they were paid crap <laughs> uh, and they had to ride circuit, which if you can imagine, right, it's not like flying from New York, which is where they were located to, you know, North Carolina, you were riding in a coach staying at hotels, and it was an awful process. And many of the people didn't want to be on the court. John Jay, our first chief justice, left to become the governor of New York. Alexander Hamilton was asked to be chief justice by John Adams, and he was like, no, that that's I would rather stay in private practice. And they just had a hard time keeping people on the court. Uh, and filling and filling the seats because of their lack of power, really, until John Marshall came along. Uh, well, that's wonderful. I love how you set up this context, especially about the judicial independence aspect, too, because that's something that I think it's it's an ideal that we all try to strive for, at least in a, in a civil society, to have some kind of independence, which is, I think, is more sacred than maybe we like to think, especially when one travels in various different parts of the world. Uh, I, I guess, you know, Hamilton and Jay, if, if, they, if they got frequent flyer miles, they will try to zip from New York to Washington or to wherever. I, maybe it would be a bit more attractive to be <laughs> to be a, be a justice at the time. Uh, you mentioned uh, John Marshall. And I, I think when I think of John Marshall, I think of that notable case, Marbury v. Madison in uh, 1803, which is undoubtedly the first kind of big case that really helped define what the Supreme Court is nowadays. So, uh, Elizabeth, uh, could you give us an overview of what that case was and and really why that's so significant when it comes to our understanding of the the formation and the evolution of the Supreme Court in its early days? Yeah, so I would argue that this is one of the most important cases the court's ever decided. In fact, I teach it in my judicial politics class and both of my separate con law classes because it's that important. So students who take me for all three classes get it three times. Um, and so I always tell them if you want an entertaining, like beginning version of this story, go listen to the election of 1800 song from Hamilton. Um, I will not be giving it as an entertaining of a touch, but basically um, the Federalists had lost all of their power. John Adams wasn't uh, an attractive candidate anymore. And they also, so they lost the executive branch and they lost Congress, which they had uh, control of both chambers. Um, there was a tie between Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson. Of course, Congress ended up eventually breaking that tie um, and choosing Thomas Jefferson to be the president. And at that time, that made Aaron Burr the vice president because you didn't have running mates. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams hated each other. John Adams was trying to basically sure up the Federalist position in the national and federal uh, government, even though he knew that he was on his way out and they were, as a whole, on their way out of Congress. So what he did is he um, had Congress basically pass a uh, law in order to create all of these new judicial appointments. So he understands that members of the judiciary will outlast him, right? Presidents often talk about how naming justices to the Supreme Court is part of their legacy because they have lifelong tenure and they will be on the bench much long after that president is out of office. And so even back then, before the Supreme Court was powerful, Adams understood that. Adams basically passes this law to name a bunch of new individuals to the bench, including a bunch of justices of the peace in Washington, D.C. Um, simultaneously, though, his um, chief justice, Oliver Ellsworth, was like, 
I enjoy being uh, a diplomat abroad more than being the chief justice, which by the way, you're technically not allowed to hold uh, a position in two different branches of government at the same time, right? So he was an ambassador, which is part of the executive branch and the chief justice. So that is problematic. So he was like, I like being a diplomat. I'm going to keep doing that. Um, And so then he was like, John Jay, will you come back? And he's like, no, I, I didn't like being on the court. Nothing has changed. There's still no power running out of options. He's like, okay, I'm going to go to my secretary of state and ask him to be my chief justice, who was John Marshall at the time. He was different than previous chief justices on the Supreme Court because one, he did have some legal training, um, which not all justices had at that time, and in fact, is not even a constitutional requirement. Also, he worked um, under George Washington, and so he also had some political savvy, which I think is really important um, when we put into perspective all of the things that he did for the court, in addition to deciding Marbury versus Madison and writing that important opinion. Just to like kind of top the cherry on top is that he was tangentially related to Thomas Jefferson. They were cousins. I don't know if they were first cousins, but I do know that they were cousins. And Thomas Jefferson hated him. So that was kind of like the cherry on top of the cake by asking him to to be the new chief justice of the Supreme Court. So he's unanimously confirmed by the Senate because the Federalists still have power. And he does a couple of things that I think it's important to note when he first gets there. Um, So the justices used to wear ornate robes and wigs. And he basically said, okay, and like they would each wear different kind of ornate robes with like, think of it more like kind of what you, what, what doctoral students wear when they graduate with like stuff on the sleeves, kind of what Rehnquist wore when he was overseeing Clinton's impeachment. Like there was more stuff going on and they were all different. They would wear the white wigs and he was like, okay no more of this. And so he had them wear just plain black robes. So they all appeared to be similar. They also, prior to him joining the court, the justices would write individually and they would write what we call seriatim opinions. So everyone would speak separately. And so what was difficult about this is that there wasn't a unified voice. So it left the other lower courts and even like reporters and attorneys trying to figure out, okay, well, what is the court saying as a whole? Because there wasn't one majority opinion. So he he changed that, um, which I think is is one of the most important things in addition to obviously the Marbury versus Madison case he decided. And just another like fun fact is that he had all the justices live because they were all men, of course, then in the same house, like real world style. They lived and had meals together and interacted with one another like, constantly. So so anyway, so John Marshall leaves his position as Secretary of State. John, Ad- or John Adams appoints all of these judges and justices of the peace. One of these justices of the peace appointments in the District of Columbia was William Marbury. A lot of people use this as like a jumping off point for their political careers. It was a good way to network and meet people. Um, The problem is, is that it's the Secretary of State's job to deliver all of these new judicial commissions. So all of these appointments that John Adams made. The problem is, is that the Secretary of State is now the Chief Justice of the United States. So you have this hole in the government And you're just kind of right. You're in this lame duck session. So you have people who are leaving um, and you're just trying to get this done before the Democratic Republicans take over. And what ends up happening is that some of the commissions don't get delivered. They basically stay on the secretary of state's desk. And so when Thomas Jefferson comes in as president, and his friend, James Madison, who he names as Secretary of State, walk into the office and they see these, Jefferson forbids Madison to deliver them. So they have been signed by Adams and they have been sealed and just essentially not delivered. William Marbury, unfortunately, him and about five other men never got their commissions. 
And so they were like, okay, we need to do something legally so we can take our positions as justice of the peace. Marbury and others who didn't get these commissions go directly to the Supreme Court. And they ask them to issue what we call a writ of mandamus, which is basically a court order telling someone in government to do something. And the reason that they went directly to the Supreme Court is because the 1789 Judiciary Act, which created um, circuit riding, lower courts, it was, it was a fundamental part of establishing our government, um, allowed people to go directly to the Supreme Court when they needed a writ of mandamus. And so basically, that is why they went directly to the Supreme Court. The problem with this is that it invokes original jurisdiction. When you go directly to the Supreme Court and the court hears a case on what we call first instance, they're the first court to ever hear the case, that's called original jurisdiction. Most of the cases that we are familiar with and how they get to the court get there under appellate jurisdiction, which means... A lower court has heard the case, then probably some type of intermediate appellate court or state Supreme Court, and then it is taken to the Supreme Court to ask them to resolve a legal question. James Madison doesn't deliver these petitions. Um, Congress ends up canceling a term of the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court is supposed to first hear Marbury versus Madison. And then they eventually hear it early 1803. So the court basically says, does William Marbury have a right to this commission? They say yes. They say that the president signed the commission. It was sealed by the secretary of state. That is a valid commission because the president has appointment power for this position. And then they said, okay, well, if he has the right to the commission, and laws of this country have been violated, do laws of this country afford him remedy? And they say, yes, laws have been violated. We do have remedy in ways that in which he can sue Madison to correct this. The problem is, is when we ask, did he seek the proper remedy? And the answer to that question is no. So John Marshall is a Federalist. He wants to give William Marbury and the rest of these people an appointment, but he is also politically savvy and strategic. And so he has the forethought to understand, like, I can win this battle or I can win the war, right? And so he thinks, okay, Congress, by giving this provision that allows individuals to come for this writ of mandamus, which invokes original jurisdiction, violates the Constitution because Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution explicitly lists when the Supreme Court can invoke original jurisdiction. It's primarily involving disputes between states or involving the president. The re- every, it basically says, and everything else is appellate jurisdiction, which Congress can figure out. So by this part of the Judiciary Act of 1789, by Congress passing it and the president signing it, technically that altered the Constitution without a constitutional amendment, which violates the Constitution. And so what they do in Marbury versus Madison is they basically say, look, we have constitutional supremacy. The Constitution says it's the court's job to interpret the Constitution that is what we are doing, and Congress violated the Constitution. So they they basically gave themselves judicial review, not something that is written in the Constitution, but they established themselves. John Marshall would have loved that uh, the description anyway. So <laughs> it's a good it's a good tribute to to him and the importance that he plays in the Supreme Court. Uh, I really like how you outlined the dynamics between Congress and the executive branch because. It seems like there's this sort of, and maybe this is just the result of something being so long ago, but there's kind of this sort of fairyland sort of idea that, oh, all the founders, because they kind of got along, you know, it's not nothing personal. Uh, well, you know, then that, I wish that was the case, but... We are we are in the real world, so um, obviously there's other cases like McCulloch v. Maryland that helped establish kind of the role of Congress 
um, especially on this issue of taxation and other issues, but really kind of made Congress also that big player too. We we go to a different uh, justice, and this is when it gets very, very tough, um, and just tough times for the Supreme Court. Um, and Elizabeth, you obviously will will know, will know obviously Chief Justice Roger Tawney. And uh, the case I'm really referring to is the Dred Scott decision. Tell us a little bit about why why that case is also important to understand the role of the Supreme Court in meddling, or not, I should say, not meddling in these very, very divisive issues in that day and age and in the present day. Yeah. So I think this case is for sure the worst case and decision in Supreme Court history. That is why... Uh, Taney statue is still in the uh, basement of the Senate, um, which is where the Supreme Court was originally housed, whereas all of the other former chief justices have busts that are in the main hallway outside of the courtroom of the Supreme Court, and his is not located there. And he's not inside of the courtroom at the Senate. He's just like in the hallway in the basement. He's also an interest. So that's a, that's a good trivia if you like your Supreme Court trivia question. Um He's an interesting fellow because he grew up on a tobacco plantation in Maryland. So, right, he already grew up in this area that's kind of straddling that what became known as that divide between North and South. Right. And he actually eventually ended up freeing the slaves that he had early on before he ever became an attorney in his career. And then there was this stark shift when he was an attorney based on a a minister that he represented who was very anti-abolitionist. The Dred Scott decision basically said, like, all Black citizens, regardless if they're slaves or free, which, by the way, in Dred Scott v. Sanford, they were free um, because they lived in Missouri, which had not yet figured out, you know, which side it was going to fall on as far as um, slavery. They basically said, no, you are not citizens of the United States. And so therefore, the rights of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights do not protect you. This was consequential for the Supreme Court because as we talk about often in judicial politics literature, the court, without that power of the purse or sword, relies on what we call a reservoir of goodwill or legitimacy, right? So they need the public's trust in order to have the ability to make decisions and then expect Congress and other people to carry them out for them, right? So this case obviously shook more than half the country and their trust in the court and its ability to make decisions for the country. And I think that's probably the most consequential piece when we are looking at it from a judicial politics standpoint and not obviously the awful consequences it had for those people living in America who were determined to not be protected by the Constitution. And it took a civil war and two amendments to basically undo that decision, right? So it wasn't until the country adopted the Reconstruction Amendment, specifically the 13th and 14th Amendment, that abolished slavery and declared all persons in the United States to be citizens and equally protected under the law. Very well said. Uh, I, I think this this case and the repercussions of it it's it's something I I wrote an essay about in college. It's it's just a it's, it's a fascinating case in this in terms of the consequences and throughout the the history of the Supreme Court. There's all these different cases that kind of show that it's not just a single body that just stands still in time. You know, we kind of think that the Supreme Court is kind of just weathered through all that storm. Well, in many cases, maybe they were the storm that kind of shaped the way we we understand things. And I want want to ask you, and while we obviously, as much as we love to go through every single case, every single interesting case of the Supreme Court, what sort of other episodes of political influence and um, and shaping of the Supreme Court that you think are particularly significant for our understanding of not only why the Supreme Court matters in American politics and the way of American life, uh, but also uh, what it teach what it tells us about uh, the history of our country and just the the importance of why we need, should understand the political influences on judicial decision making. Yeah. So 
I think that another major case that is worth noting is Baker v. Carr. This case is basically the case that said one person, one vote. This was incredibly divisive amongst the justices as to whether or not they should even take this case because the Constitution says they shouldn't take political cases. And John Marshall defined political cases as those which are better left up to another branch of government to decide. And Baker v. Carr was basically about districting and how to count individuals within a district. Many felt very adamant that this, on the court that they shouldn't hear this case because uh, it would lead them down this road of deciding more political cases. Uh, and I think it was an incredibly important decision, right, because we did get this one man, one vote um, decision out of it, which I think had huge consequences for future legislation um, in Congress and decisions on the court. But at the same time, it really um, moved them into this political arena, which they hadn't necessarily dabbled in in that way previously, right? Because now they're getting into elections, um, which is something that they really hadn't forayed into in the past. I know it's really difficult for some of those older cases, but have you seen any patterns on people's behavior and reaction to the court after these decisions? And if so, what exactly is happening with that public perception reaction to the Supreme Court decisions? Um, well, it's hard to say really with decisions that are like that old. Um, obviously, Marbury versus Madison gave the court a tremendous amount of power that they hadn't previously had. It made the position much, eventually, I should say, not immediately, but eventually it made the position much more lucrative um, and desirable. And now, right, like to to be a justice on the United States Supreme Court is the mo- like highest level you can achieve in a legal career. That, I think, was obviously incredibly consequential. But as far as, like, the the kind of reverberations or shocks after a case, like, historically, it's hard to say because we obviously, when we think about things like that, we think about, well, like, public opinion polls. How did the public react to these decisions? And we didn't have that type of data back then. Um, I keep going, though, to, like, other bad decisions, <laughs> Um, and so like a more a more recent bad decision, I, or I would say contemporary, not recent, but contemporary or modern, would be the Korematsu decision to put Japanese Americans in internment camps during World War II. What I always tell my students is that the most interesting thing about that decision and about our common law system is that that decision stayed on the books for years. Did the Supreme Court cite it negatively? Yeah. But did they ever overturn it like right after? No, they didn't. And it wasn't until I believe Neil Katyal was the Solicitor General during the Obama administration and he filed what we call a confession of air. Um, my friends wrote a paper on this, Shaner and Waterbury. It's in the Journal of Law and Courts. And basically, it wasn't until then that even anyone had acknowledged like that was such a mistake that the executive branch did that and that the court did that. That That's like a contemporary case I feel like had huge ramifications and probably lost a lot of trust and goodwill in the court. Um, I think, obviously, there's so many to point to in more modern times. Going off of Baker v. Carr, I think Citizens United is a huge one, right? It's not often that a president is going to not only acknowledge a court decision, but tell them that they were wrong um, during a State of the Union with them sitting in front of him, uh, as President Obama did after the Citizens United decision. Um, Obviously, there's like landmark cases that we could talk about all day, but I think it's It's the cases that kind of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, right? Like 
poor Matsu was an awful decision. A lot of people disagree with Citizens United as to whether does money equal speech. According to the court, yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 hard to I guess assess that in in the broader terms. But public mood and public opinion, I think, has been decreasing for years with the Supreme Court. It's it's been the highest um, trusted institution for a long time, right? More than Congress and the executive, but it's diminishing and it's continuing to diminish partially because people perceive the court as being more politicized and polarized because of their decisions, but also because of what happens during the nomination process. Um, Especially starting with like Robert Bork to Merrick Garland, right? Some of these nominations were incredibly politicized. And so even though the court perhaps wasn't even acting, like when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, the court had not yet started session for that term or had not started that term because she passed away in September and the court starts their term in October. The court was politicized by what people in the Senate were saying, what the president was saying, even though they weren't even handing down decisions or hearing cases at that time. It's just so fascinating to see the repercussions of what people decide in Supreme Court, and all of a sudden the the, the politicians. I, you know, like I, I would use the analogy of how some people view the court as like the adults, and the politicians are the are the kids. So <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to belittle anyone. I'm just saying that that's that's kind of at least how some people kind of feel about the Supreme Court in terms of making these decisions like, okay, this is a decision whether you like it or not. Um, and I, I, I want to ask about really the the way that that politicians have been reacting to Supreme Court nominations and decisions. How have the behavior and actions of politicians contributed to the perception of both the nomination process, and the United States Supreme Court as a whole. Yeah, so this process has actually evolved quite a bit. So John Marshall Harlan was the first justice to ever appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee that had been nominated. Prior to that, no one had ever like gone before the committee and answered questions. Um, And then for years, they only did a voice vote, right? So they didn't actually do a roll call vote where they voted individually in the Senate for the justices. They just, you know, yay, nay, yays have it type of thing. And then we start having these questionnaires that nominees have to fill out. They have to meet with senators prior to sitting before the Senate Judiciary Committee and answering their questions. I think we all can point to three particular circumstances besides John Marshall Harlan starting to appear before the court that definitively changed the way politicians and individuals view the nomination process, as well as how the nominees approach the nomination process. So the first is Robert Bork, um, right? As soon as Reagan announced him as his nominee, Senator Ted Kennedy made that famous speech on the Senate floor about Robert Bork's America, where women would have to get back alley abortions, where certain minorities were not viewed as people. And Robert Bork was incredibly, incredibly qualified for the Supreme Court. Um, Tons of academic work, tons of like very well-respected just legal work. The problem is, is that he had a long paper trail. And he also wasn't shy about talking about his beliefs and that paper trail. So for example, like with the Baker v. Carr case, someone asks him, you know, about that case during his confirmation hearing. And he says, as an originalist, people may believe in one person, one vote, but that's not written in the Constitution. And so he was the first nominee in a very long time who had been denied confirmation, right? Because he was seen even as too too extreme on behalf of some of the Republicans in President Reagan's own party, right? And so we got, obviously, very moderate Justice Kennedy 
um, as a result, right? And he 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 loved being the median on the court. I also oftentimes wonder if that those were his true preferences that he expressed in the way he voted, or if he just liked being the king kingmaker. The second is uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's Supreme Court confirmation hearing, which I actually have to go back in time for that, right? Because she was President Reagan's first Supreme Court nominee because he made that promise on the campaign trail to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. She was also a fun trivia question. Uh, Justice Rehnquist, um, law school cohort graduate. Uh, So he, I believe, finished first in his class and she finished third or something like that. Um, And he proposed to her and they dated at one point. Um, Her book, by uh, the book about her by Evan Thomas is incredible. So um, yeah, so her confirmation hearings were the first ones to be televised. And there's work by Ferganis and Wedeking. There's a whole book that they wrote that shows that that change in televising the confirmation hearings increased the number of interest groups that got involved, advocating for a nominee and also opposing a nominee. So that creates contention, right? Because politicians need to rely on those interest groups to get funding for their political campaigns. And then it also changed senators' behavior. So when the nominations or confirmation hearings started to be televised, um, they started behaving differently. They started asking more questions of view. So these questions about cases, their views about certain types of law, as opposed to questions of fact. Where did you go to law school? Why are you qualified? Things like that. And so that changed their behavior. They do what we call grandstand. Basically, they try to appeal to their constituents by the types of questions they're asking instead of just kind of advising and giving consent, as the as the Constitution says. We find that even if they know they can't like overturn the nominee if they're in the opposing party as the president, because maybe his party has power in the Senate. Um, they will, they will show their constituents that they're standing up for what they want by the types of questions that they ask. So we had that shift. And then we had Robert Bork, which I went out of order, um, which changed the way senators voted, right? So they used to weigh qualifications and ideological distance. So how much in line they were with the nominee based on the person who nominated them, the president, uh, equally. And research shows that after that, Qualifications, while still important, not as important as similar ideologies, right? And so that changed the way that senators assessed the nominees and voted for them. And then lastly is Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nomination um, by President Bill Clinton. So she established what we call the Ginsburg rule. So one of the problems Robert Bork has is that he was too forthcoming, Ruth Bader Ginsburg takes this approach where she says no forecasts, no previews. So when people would ask her questions about privacy or abortion or um, other due process related topics, she would say, you know, Senator, I'm very sorry that I can't answer that question because it is likely a topic that will come before the court, right? And because the court doesn't answer hypothetical cases, she doesn't want to be, you know, have a sound bite of her saying, I would decide the case in this way. When a case would get to the Supreme Court, the case facts likely to be different than whatever hypothetical a senator proposed and then be like beholden to that previous opinion. And so once she did that, Um, basically we find that nominees continue to do that. And so it appears that they're being more evasive, but what ended up happening is senators kept asking more of these invasive questions because they thought it made the nominee look bad, especially if they're of the opposing party. Those three events, opening it up to the masses to allow them to see what this process looks like so that senators can, in a way, speak to their constituents, right? Because it's one of the most probably watched things in the Senate, unless there's like an impeachment, right? That's a that's a big event that's talked about on the news every night. Sound bites are shown. And then Robert Bork not getting confirmed. 
Um, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And then, I mean, we can talk about the nuclear option, which is much more recent. Um, so when George W. Bush was president, the Senate was blocking all of his lower court nominees. A group of senators got together, bipartisan group, and was like, okay, we can't have this. Like, we have so many empty spots on the lower court. And we have all of these judges backed up that we keep denying. So we need to get together and we need to like make this work. And so they did. But then the next term, Obama was being blocked. Um, His lower court nominees were being blocked. Record number of lower court nominees blocked. And the Senate went nuclear. So what this means is that basically they interpreted Senate Rule 22, um, which required like it has the filibuster and cloture rules, which allowed, you know, the minority party to filibuster a nominee, which was holding up the voting process and required that cloture vote. It got rid of that. And it only needed a simple majority then to confirm a nominee, which sped up the process a ton. But the Democrats did that. And then the Republicans, when they had control of the Senate, eventually got them back by going nuclear on the final thing that had been untouched uh, by the nuclear option. And they went nuclear on the Supreme Court. So basically, Neil Gorsuch was able to be confirmed with a simple majority. um, And every nominee since him has been able to be confirmed by a simple majority. So that's also why we see like these numbers. In addition to polarization, the yay votes for a nominee have decreased significantly because they simply do not need that other party support anymore. You know, there was, there was, I was speaking to someone on the Hill and they said, boy, it's really, it's really become a, a like a TV production on, Mm -hmm. uh, on Capitol Hill. You know, we think of Hollywood and in Los Angeles, there's another Hollywood in, on the Capitol Hill. And it just seems like you mentioned about the televised hearings. It kind of made me think about how there's a reason why you don't see television in the Supreme court. It seems like, yes. you know, at least seems, and I, I, I want to ask you, you know, what, what sort of things do you think should be considered or reconsidered when it comes to the, the future of the nomination process? And I, I don't th- say that just on the Supreme court, but I also think on, on a lot of federal judges, a lot of lower court judges, um, that while there are certain judges that pass by voice vote, um, I've seen, I've seen some of these numbers is again, going along party line vote. Yeah, so a lot of people have strong opinions about the filibuster um, and how democratic that is. So I don't necessarily think that that going away or bringing or if we were to bring the filibuster back, that that would necessarily make the process more democratic. I think it would slow things down. And to be honest, right, if even if you disagree with a lot of you know, the nominees who are appointed to the bench during a certain presidency, people still need access to justice, right? And they still need to have their day in court because unlike the Supreme Court, circuit courts and federal district courts do not have discretion in the cases that they hear, which means that they're not deciding, you know, 70 cases a term like the Supreme Court. They are like nose to the grindstone every day, hearing a bunch of cases, some they don't even write opinions for. A lot of them they don't write opinions for because they hear so many. So we do need qualified individuals in this seat. Um, One thing that, that changed was the ABA's involvement in recent years. So the American Bar Association used to help the president vet nominees. They will give a rating of qualified very qualified or not qualified. George W. Bush didn't allow them like an early preview to to like get that rating up basically before the nominee is named and and neither did Donald Trump. Obama did and Biden decided that, or sorry, yeah, Biden decided that he wasn't going to do that. And actually one of the reasons why, which I think is important is because they put a lot of weight in former litigation experience. What this does is it hurts younger nominees, it hurts female nominees, and it hurts minority nominees um, because they oftentimes are the ones with less 
I guess, prestigious litigation experience, like at an appellate level. For example, the judge out of Florida who overturned the transportation mask mandate, she received an unqualified rating by the American Bar Association. Some people believe she was unqualified, but she worked as Clarence Thomas's clerk. I believe she had two clerkships prior to that. I don't know if it was a circuit and circuit court or district and circuit court. And she worked in the government as an attorney for three years, and she worked at a law firm. As a clerk on the Supreme Court or any federal court, that's basically like residency, right, as a judge um, in the legal profession. You can equate it to that. So I, I don't think it's fair just because she didn't litigate very many cases to say that she was unqualified. One of the problems, though, is is what outside interests presidents do listen to. You know, President Trump was very open about um, him letting the Federalist Society help him choose his nominees, which is a, they, they describe themselves as a conservative legal group that shares like values and exchange of legal beliefs and philosophies type of thing, right? They don't describe themselves as an interest group. That kind of became like a litmus test for him. Are you a member of the Federalist Society? Okay, well, that means, you know, you're conservative enough for me, essentially. And so I think like what outside interests are involved in selecting and and choosing nominees is really important, both at the Supreme Court level and at the lower court level. And now I don't think this is all a bad thing, um, especially when we talk about things like blue slips. So let's say you have a vacancy in your Senate district. I live in Louisiana, so we have two Republican senators. Um, What this blue slip would do would be allow them to submit an individual's name to the president who they would recommend as a judge in the state of Louisiana in one of the three federal districts. And so I think that is a good thing. I don't believe that they are being utilized as much or, I guess, respected as much cross party lines anymore. Um, But I think that's something, a blue slip courtesy that needs to come back. But honestly, I, I question if we will ever be able to come back from the Merrick Garland situation. I think that that was unheard of obviously unprecedented um, that, you know, there's, I think, nine months left, right? I think Scalia died in February of a presidential term, and you're going to say the next president should should choose that nominee. But then to turn around, you know, four years later, and the same thing happens in September, so, you know, two months out from the election, and name a nominee and confirm her in less than three weeks. I think that until, you know, um, maybe Mitch McConnell leaves, I, I not, not to get too partisan, but I think like he is an incredible political strategist and ha- constantly wins. I mean, he's done a lot to alter the federal judiciary in the Republicans' favor. And I just think his political maneuvering has really hurt the way the American public views the judiciary as far as how politicized it is. And I think he's helped politicize it by, you know, his flip flopping on on confirming a Supreme Court justice and also the type of people that he's named to or helped get named to the federal bench. But, you know, he was really, really angry uh, after everything that happened with Clarence Thomas. There's a great PBS documentary um, on Frontline about it. And he basically was out for revenge. And so that's where they say like all of this, you know, animosity came from. So I think that the Merrick Garland to Amy Coney Barrett situation are really hard to come back from. And I think, you know, is on to, to go back to where we started is Undemocratic, as a lot of people think the filibuster is, what it did cause presidents to do is to name more moderate nominees uh, because they had to get that cross-party support. 
And so what we are seeing um, now that there is no filibuster is that you can name, if your party is in power in the Senate, you can name much more extreme, ideologically extreme nominees to the Supreme Court. Well, that's a lot of great ideas to to think about. And pretty sure it's still a tradition now, but uh, I believe all the Supreme Court justices eat meals together and mm-hmm. they they understand that ability to to just be collegial to one another. I mean, there's there's you're probably very familiar with the the relationship between Ginsburg and Scalia. They have very different opinions on a lot of things, but it's like why it seems like why is it that we can't while well, we can't turn back the clock, why can't we turn back to to some more civil things and to more 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 collegial manners? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so I mean, like even before the justices uh, sit down for conference, which is when they vote, they place their initial votes on cases they heard at oral arguments, or they vote on which cases they're going to grant review, depending on uh, what day the conference is on, they shake each other's hand. So one justice equates that as a civil gesture. Another justice um equates that to like dapping someone before a boxing match. So take that with what you will. But yes, they eat meals together. Some are definitely more collegial than others. There are folks that are working on a book right now, um, Mike Nelson, Morgan Hazleton, and Rachel Hinkle, uh, basically about this very topic. How collegial are the Supreme Court justices? How collegial are their clerks? And what they're finding is like some justices are are not collegial, right? They're not uh, really enjoyable people to be around. I don't think that's completely surprising, right? Like I don't think most of us think of Justice Douglas as a warm and fuzzy person. Yeah, they they eat meals together, but then there's also right like this mutual respect that a lot of them have. And so something that's come up in the news recently is like, yeah, even though they're disagreeing with one another, they have this mutual respect. But then when Neil Gorsuch refused to wear a mask and Justice Sonia Sonia Sotomayor decided to stay at home and conference in for oral arguments because of her diabetes makes her, you know, obviously uh, COVID is more serious if she were to get it. Um, People like said that that was a slight to her and showed that like he didn't respect her as a colleague, uh, especially because they're seated next to one another on the bench. We don't know what goes on at the Supreme Court. Their clerks don't really like to talk about it. Um, And if they do, they're anonymous. So we don't know who they're talking about. We can only assume from the outside, as you mentioned previously, there's no cameras in the court. The justices don't want cameras in the court. They don't want sound bites of them being taken out of context. They don't want to appear more political than they are. And I think that if people were to see how often they interrupt one another, how often they interrupt attorneys, I think if anyone's ever listened to an oral argument, I I, I always think it surprises them, right? Attorneys might not even get after Mr. Chief Justice and may it please the court and, and someone jumps in on them, right? And so they're supposed to have a rule that they adopted, I think, last term that allows uh, attorneys to speak for two minutes before being interrupted. And they like didn't even really stick to that very well. A lot of the justices have it for one another and they get along. What a lot of people may not know is that the clerks will even work together uh, because like 10,000 people ask the court to hear their case each term. So it's 10,000 petitions, 10,000 cases to review. So the, most of the justices have their clerks work in a clerk pool which means that they divide and conquer these 10,000 petitions. But Alito and Gorsuch do not participate in the pool. So their clerks have to go through everything by themselves. So obviously, like, right, the, the environment amongst those who work in the pool is probably a bit more collegial than those who are not in the pool. Uh, well, that's that's awesome. Uh, just to, to kind of think about the role of the Supreme Court, but in a kind of a different light, not just like in terms of the cases, but really a little bit about their interactions. It's something that I think can read more about. I'm certainly, after, after this episode, I'm certainly going to be reading more about uh, Supreme Court trivia and just the interesting facts because um, it's, I, and there's there's just so many so many good takeaways, I think, so many interesting things that one can can get from that. And, um, you know, as you, as you know, you know, we have, we, we really reflect on Washington's principles. We go 
even back in time again. I know we've jumped in the time machine a few times to today, but um, we we think a lot about the principles from Washington's farewell address all the way back to 1796 when you know Marbury v. Madison wasn't even a thing at the time. You know things were certainly brewing. You know out of the values, out of the principles that we we frequently outline in this podcast, what which one or which ones do you think? I think are most relevant or things that we should maybe think about when it comes to the influence of politics on the judiciary system. Yeah, I, I think I would definitely touch on civility. For a long time, the, the judicial branch, and I think in, still in areas, in certain legal issues, it is this way, that the judicial branch was seen as the last say, right? Which is not always the case. If it's a statutory ruling, Congress can most certainly overturn it or introduce a constitutional amendment. But they have been seen as the more civil branch. You described them earlier as almost like the parents, right, when the two other branches are fighting. And I think that's a a really apt way to kind of describe the way that we thought of the Supreme Court historically. Since I've started teaching judicial politics, students had really bought into this myth of legality that we would hear being spoken about, right? Like the Supreme Court justices are different than members of Congress, right? They're not politicians in robes. As John Roberts would say, they're umpires calling balls and strikes. But what anyone who is a sports fan knows is that a lot of plays are subjective and that refs can get things wrong, right? As someone who lives in Louisiana that moved here the year after the past interference kept the Saints out of the Super Bowl, um, I, I definitely understand how refs can get things wrong. And so I think that that simplicity of saying that the law is balls and strikes is black and white is definitely not the case. The law can be subjective. How an individual applies precedent can be subjective. But I think what has always kept the court as seeing seeming above the fray in, in having this civility is because of how they, they, they make their decisions, right? They don't just say, I'm making a decision this way because that's what I think. Although they decide cases based on their preferences, they have to support it with legal reasoning and Supreme Court precedent. I think that is what has like kept the public's hope uh, and, and trust in the Supreme Court as an institution. And, and hopefully it can stay there. But I definitely think there's no question since since when I started teaching judicial politics till now, students are not not clouded over with this myth of legality like they used to be. And I think a lot of that is not necessarily due to the decisions that has been made by the justices. I think a lot of it is due to how uncivil the nomination and confirmation process has become. If there was a tr- trivia, Supreme Court trivia uh, competition, maybe maybe we can call out the folks at Jeopardy. Um, would would you be one of the first ones to be willing to to compete? I I, I just I'm raising my hand and not nom- nominate you <laughs> if if that were to happen. Yeah, I would I would love that. I spent two summers working um, at the Library of Congress uh, with the wonderful people in the manuscript division. So I did not get to work at the Jefferson Building, which is the beautiful Library of Congress building that most people are familiar with. I was at the Adams Building and it's it's depressing. Um, But going through Harry Blackman's papers and Thurgood Marshall's papers was one of the most interesting things that I've ever done. So I I would totally be down for Supreme Court trivia. (laughs) Uh, Excellent. Uh, And and, um, what future plans do you have for your research? And how can people learn more about what you're doing on this area of research on the politics and influence on the Supreme Court? Yeah. So, I mean, I, as a political scientist, take an empirical approach to studying judicial politics, particularly with a quantitative background. Um, And so I don't like to make like normative assessments of the court, although I did do that today. Um, I tried to keep my work objective and, and let the statistics in existing theories inform my work. I am doing work about how the law influences the Supreme Court. I am also doing work about gender roles and how the gender and the identity, particularly in the racial identity of attorneys can influence case outcomes. And basically what we find is that 
women are really good at writing briefs, but they're not taken quite as seriously when they argue before the court. And so hopefully that will begin. I, I hope that that begins to change as more women graduate from law school, right? We've reached parity at the top law schools in the country. So hopefully that will start to change. And the justices are aware when when researchers find things like this. So Justice Sotomayor brought an article. She's now moving to Emory Law School. Her name's Tanya Jacoby, to the justice's opinion that basically revealed that male justices and male attorneys interrupt female justices more. And so she brought that to Chief Justice Roberts' like knowledge. She, she showed the article to him and he he was basically like, we need to fix this. We can't let this happen. We are all equals here. It's good that they recognize that, but they also don't really like social science. Um, I'm a social scientist. As I believe Breyer said it, uh, it's a bunch of gobbledygook. So um, <laughs> I don't expect any of my work to influence the court, but I hope that people will, you know, want to learn about them. And I would say a good place to start is to read Woodward and Armstrong's The Brethren. It's about the Burger Court. And it's a wonderful kind of behind the the curtain, literally, look at the Supreme Court because they they were able to interview clerks and justices. W- wonderful. And, and obviously, I'll include probably the most important link uh, down in the show notes below. I'll, I'll put a link to your website, Elizabeth, so that people can learn more about you. And uh, uh, to wrap up, uh, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. You know, you've, you're you obviously incredibly busy as a professor teaching all those classes. And um, I, I, can't, I can imagine how much excitement uh, I would be as an LSU student taking a class from you because uh, I'll definitely be taking a lot of notes, a uh, lot, lot of notebooks to buy from the stationery store. <laughs> but uh, it's it's just wonderful to, to get that historical context um, about Justice Marshall or about uh, Dred Scott decision or about some of those c- circumstances that have changed. Uh, because I think just like the other, so many other things, um, there's it's all part of American history that we can that we can learn from. So um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for, for coming to our podcast this week. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. I love any opportunity I can to nerd out about the Supreme Court. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to check out Elizabeth's website down in the show notes below to learn more about her research. Enjoy the rest of your day and rest of your week. And remember, a day in America is always better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens. And I'll see you next time.